Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safford and this is Kitco News. Now 2024, well, it's a big year. We have significant elections in countries representing over 40% of the global GDP, a factor that could sway economic policies and subsequently commodity markets worldwide. This all while we are seeing a spiked interest in precious metals, notably gold, platinum, and palladium, as investors seek refuge and diversification in these uncertain times. And central banks have been at the forefront of this trend, with foreign central banks purchasing a staggering 1,037 tons of gold last year alone, making it the second highest year on record for official sector gold purchases. And notably, the People's Bank of China has made headlines by buying about 225 tons that's the highest since records began in 1977, signaling a robust appetite for gold as a strategic reserve. Now, on the investor front, after a prolonged period of selling, ETF investors have been on a pause of their divestments, culminating a remarkable 13.3% rise in gold prices from October through to the end of last year, 2023. Now, this shift, of course, underscores a renewed confidence in gold as a safe heaven and a hedge against uncertainty. Now, when we look at the mining industry, it's a little bit different. It faces its own set of challenges, struggling to keep pace with the surging demand from central banks and other investors. This imbalance raises questions about the sustainability of supply and the potential implications for future price movements. Now, helping us break all of this down today on the show, we're privileged to welcome Bob Minter, Director of ETF Strategy at Arberdeen, where his extensive expertise rather spans from setting commodity and ETF strategy. And of course, you had a distinguished career that includes roles at Fidelity Investment and Vanguard Group. Bob, thanks for being on the show with us today to chat about all this. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Of course. You know, I want to start right on the top when we talked about central banks and we're, we're, we're seeing central banks, especially those emerging economies, stockpiling gold at an unprecedented rate here. So I'm curious, you know, what's driving this rush towards gold? Is it a, a lack of faith in the fiat currency? Is it a hedge against potential economic turmoil? Or is it something else? So I, I, I'd like to, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of ways to go that get very political, very geopolitical, very quickly. And yeah. I always like to, to kind of distance myself from that and, and say, well, what would I do if I were in someone's position? And again, this is across the political spectrum, whether it was President um, George Bush or Obama or Trump or Biden, all four presidents have used the dollar's reserve status as a means or an arm of U.S. foreign policy. And that's where a lot of the risk to emerging market economies come from, it's from sanctions. And so if I were in charge of a countries and emerging market countries, foreign exchange reserves, I would want to diversify away from the dollar. There's all sorts of technical reasons why, you know, it's not the death of the dollar. The U.S. does a great job of overspending and sending our dollars overseas. So that's one thing you need for a, a reserve currency status is you need your currency to be overseas. So, um it's not the death of the, do of the dollar, it's not Armageddon, but it, it does make a pretty big difference to gold if some of these countries are selling down their treasuries, which is a huge market, uh, selling down a little bit of their treasuries and buying gold. Um, because you can see we, we set what would be all-time records um, last year and the year before. Uh, they were very close to each other, um, the, the, the central bank purchases totals. So that, to our mind, looks to continue. Mm -hmm. And the reason we think it's going to continue is because of what, what happened last August at the BRICS meeting. And at that okay. meeting, um, we all know what the BRICS are, right? Br uh, yep. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Well, at, at the meeting last August, uh, six additional countries were added to that organization, and maybe more importantly, 40 other countries applied for membership. So there's no lack of interest in joining this BRICS organization, um, which we view as a, a, as a way for those countries to hedge their foreign exchange risk, their sanctions risk um, with the U.S. 
Yeah. You know, could there be a also be a strategic move to enhance their influence on the global financial stage by increasing their global reserves here? Absolutely. Uh, certainly you you harden your currency with gold. You don't harden it with, um, you know, a cryptocurrency. So um, gold is key to um, a key part of the monetary system. Interesting. So what are your predictions? I mean, you mentioned on the top here, you're not expecting that those purchasing, that purchasing power from the central banks will be going any time soon down. So what are your predictions for this year? Do you think that it's just going to be increasing? Well, so what we like to do for our clients is we like to let them decide. We like to tell them what we see. Uh, and so we looked at the last three times we were at this point in the Fed funds uh, cycle. So mm -hmm. we start the clock at the last hike. And when we went and then we stopped the clock at the maximum price of gold that follows. And so in the year 2000, we had that. We had that occur in twenty in two thousand and six. We had it occur again, and in two thousand eighteen, we had it occur a third time. Those are the last three times we were at this sort of point. We can argue whether the first cut's going to come in June or September, but we know that there we're, we're we're done with the hikes. So yeah. um, those last three times in two thousand, two thousand six, and two thousand eighteen, gold went on to rise fifty seven percent, two hundred and thirty five percent and 70 percent respectively so those are those are returns that are you should have this on your radar um, right now the 235 percent of course occurred in the middle of global financial crisis we have to qe one two and three and etc so we don't really see anybody with those kinds of scenarios um with with a very high probability right now so we can probably cross out the 235 percent but um we also didn't have central bank purchases at this level any of those three times now bob you've noted that etf investors have recently put a pause on selling their gold holdings contributing to a notable rise in gold prices what does this signal about the investors sentiments towards gold and how significant is this trend in shaping the market's direction so we all we all like bumper sticker answers. I do right. too. It's a good it's a good you know heuristic to to follow something, especially in the multi asset world where you're trying to follow all sorts of correlations. The important thing is that they do change, and so uh, historically, in, in gold investors have looked to ten year tips, real yields, um, and you know when real yields rise, since gold doesn't have a yield. Gold prices tend to fall when real yields rise. Now, the exception to that is uh, the, the, the correlation started to break most recently in April of 2022. And in April of 2022, ETF investors, and we're talking about the industry, we're not talking about Aberdeen specifically. So we're talking much larger uh, group of investors started selling gold and and they were selling gold in a big way. They wound up selling 21 million ounces of gold through the end of 2023. So from April of 2022 all the way through the end of the year of 2022, gold prices really didn't fall. As a matter of fact, for 2022, the the price of gold only fell like uh, two tenths of one percent. So right. minuscule. And then in 2023, of course, gold was up 13.1%. Almost entirely all came from that period from October till the end of December. And that's actually when ETF investors stopped selling. They didn't start buying. They just stopped selling. So I, I look at that as ETF in investors stopped selling their gold to central banks. So it created um, a shortage of of supply of sorts, and and that's where we that's where we got the thirteen percent. Right, right. You know, it's interesting because obviously some might argue that the pause is a temporary reaction to current market uncertainties, rather than a, a bigger long term shift in investment strategies. Uh, how do you view this? Is this just a trend, or is this something more sustainable here? So I I think. Part of the reasons why the the ETF investors stopped selling was because they started 
to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, right. that, that the Fed was getting closer to, uh, they already had signaled a pause, but they had, were getting closer to a potential cut. And so that put them on pause. And, and, and I should say the real reason we're only talking about central bank demand and, and ETF investor demand is um, there are, of course, other uh, sources of demand for gold. They are a lot less variable year to year than the two we're talking about, which is the reason why we, we're talking about these. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned supply and demand here. You know, with the, with the mining industry facing challenges to meet the soaring demand for gold, what implications does this have for future gold prices and their stability of supply? I mean, are there innovations or changes on the horizon that you think could ease these pressures? So mining companies are, are actually getting quite a bad name for not, not entirely deserved reasons. Um, you know, mining companies really are making some progress in ESG. I'll give you a couple of, of, of examples. One is... Uh, I know of a miner in South America that um, had to put in a water desalinization plant in order to provide water to the mine. They actually built two, one for the town, the nearby town. So the, the town had a, a, a very large supply of fresh, clean drinking water. Another one is there's, a, there's a, another mining company that uh, experimented with technology and they're using energy pulse technology, which sounds like it would be heavy, heavy uh, energy use, but it actually saves 80% of the energy to um, break up break up ore that a mechanical means that a grinder would, would, would use. So that's a big win. Another thing is uh, another miner is using a, a, a hydrogen electric combination earth mover. So they're using a hydrogen fuel cell along with uh, a battery, and of course, there's no fossil fuels full fossil fuels used there. So yeah. they are at the forefront. They are making these innovations, um, but but there still are 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 problems, and some of the problems that are holding back supply, not just in gold, but also in copper and in other mines, is they can be dirty. So uh, governments are correct for having a very stringent um, permitting process, and that's only more stringent now um, as environmental concerns are raised uh, to to a sort of public level. And um, sometimes governments can view these metals as sort of a lottery ticket for their citizens, and they can tend to put pressure to raise taxes, which of course um, can really undermine the, the mine profitability. And we've seen some miners actually leave countries and go to less desirable countries just because they can more accurately predict what, what the economics will be. Yeah. So, so it is a um, complicated area. Now, Bob, we've observed a notable shift in the palladium market with prices falling below that of platinum for the first time since 2018, April of 2018. And this, of course, largely due to demands, concerns, and expectations of stable supply. Now, this drop reflects a 39% decline in palladium prices in 2023, influenced by the auto sector shift from palladium to platinum in auto catalysis. Uh, say that 10 times. And of course, we have the rise of electric vehicles. I'm I'm curious here, you know, considering that South Africa and Russia, which account for 80% of global palladium mine output, show no sign of redu reducing production. Do you see this as a long-term trend? And if so, what does this mean for investors? So, uh, so just on Russia and South Africa, they both, actually the, the supply is so concentrated from Russia, the number of times people have looked at putting sanctions on Russia on those metals, and they realize they r would cause immediate problems for the auto market um, if, if they did something like that. Uh, South Africa has its own problems, has a major utility, which hasn't upgraded or done corrective maintenance on, in some cases, uh, coal-fired generation plants that are over 50 years old. And so they have a very unstable electricity supply market there. 
not to state the obvious, but in a mine, it's dark. You need the electricity. They can bring in diesel power generators, hugely more expensive to run than than just um, through a public utility. And so um, there are some some eye watering statistics about how many times a year the electricity is involuntarily cut off by the utility mm. in, in South Africa. So it is affecting the mine supply. What is affecting the platinum and palladium price even more, and that's where the opportunity lies, is this electric vehicle theme. And uh, we've all seen the, the the millions of stories out there about the electric vehicles. Um, I myself placed an order for an electric vehicle, wound up canceling it because I thought there were there was going to be more stimulus and it came in came in a little bit higher price than I thought it was going to be. So I'm not opposed philosophically to them. It's just it needs to be economic. And that matches with an awful lot of the trends we're seeing lately where it's it's a it's a bit shorthand to say this um, uh, that that everybody that wants an electric vehicle already has one um, or everybody that wants one and can afford one already has one. Um, and you can see that with Tesla lowering their prices. So if you think about it, while the negative for platinum and palladium were that everyone was going to want an electric vehicle, the reality is that people, the hottest market in the, in the auto market is the hybrid market, which is, has a gasoline and a battery powered engine, and of course still needs a, a catalytic converter. So we think the theme is way oversold, certainly mm -hmm. versus reality um, and, and, and real demand. But these are smaller markets that we're talking about. It's not, we're not talking about gold. Um, so, so this sentiment can have a bigger effect on the price and um, so we're looking for a bounce in platinum and palladium this year. Okay. And is, what's your outlook? What's your 2024 outlook for platinum and palladium? So we, we, I don't like to give a specific price because mm -hmm. the this is a correction in um, this is a correction in sentiment, not in actual demand. The demand is there. Uh, the Platinum Institute forecasts a, a deficit for both this year, um, and I believe they still have a deficit for Platinum last year, um, and, and the price really didn't perform very well. So it has separated a little bit from the fundamentals of supply and demand, and, and it is more of a, a sentiment-driven market at this point. Yeah. And, you know, there's that perspective that suggests a potential oversupply if the demand for catalytic converters and vehicles diminishes faster than expected. Kind of, as you mentioned, uh, more smoke than fire here? I I think so. Yeah. I, oh, well, I'll give you an anecdotal story. I, I, I rented a car in, in Florida and it was a um, electric Jeep Wrangler, which is a hybrid. So it has a gasoline engine and a battery. And um, the guy in the charging station next to me uh, had a had a Mach E, and I asked him jokingly, "Do you want to swap?" and And he said, "I would in a second because I like to not have to be forced with his all battery powered car um, to be forced to to stop and charge." Um, whereas so. with with a hybrid, you can use the battery till it's done and then switch to to uh, gasoline, so. Yeah, yeah, I've used a hybrid too. Totally, uh, it makes a little bit more sense when you punch it, you still got that gasoline there if you need it, you know? Uh, Bob, considering yes. the current economic climate and obviously the trends that we just discussed, where do you see the most promising investment opportunities in precious metals for our viewers who are looking to preserve, but also, of course, grow their wealth this year? So, one of the, in 2024, we think that the trends that that were occurring in 2023 will reverse. Mm -hmm. And so if we go back 12 months, January, February of last year, everyone had just piled into the China reopening story. They had very they had very long lengths in the contracts of uh, of the industrial metals and a number of other metals. They've since all come out because of the reopening has been disappointing. We were all expecting a sort of U.S. 
style and size stimulus, um, which China did not do. Uh, yet they did do stimulus, and um, we do expect there to be stimulus this year. Obviously, they need to get a handle on the debt in the right. in the real estate market. But it's really important not to ignore the positive story. And, and some of that is related to the um, renewables trade. 80% of all of the solar panels come from China. There's nothing wrong with that demand. They are, um, they are producing solar panels at an incredible rate. And of course, there's a lot of silver and, and other metals in there. So for us, we like the secular longer term trend of renewables. We like industrial metals because there just is not going to be enough of them around. And um, to have any sort of a meaningful energy transition, regardless of short term um, stalling in, in, in growth of electric vehicles. Uh, so so for, that is a hot spot for us to keep an eye on as well as gold. Yeah, industrial metals and gold, as you mentioned. Now, I'm going to let you go here, but before you do that, you are the ETF guy. So I have to ask you, you know, with the allure of cryptocurrencies and digital assets growing among investors, especially, of course, the younger demographic, but now it's a little bit more mainstream since the launch of spot Bitcoin ETFs. So how do precious metals compete as a viable investment option in this new digital age? So, um, you know, there's, there's a guy in the 70s and 80s called Peter Lynch, and he used to say, know your investment, know what it's used for. And so I look around and I can't buy anything with Bitcoin. And so it's not a currency because it's, you can't use it as a currency. I don't know why any central bank would want to give up control of their money supply to some unknown entity that issues uh, a cryptocurrency and um you know 6300 years of of use of gold is as jewelry and and money i think are a little more stable source than you know 12 years of the crypto's been around yeah. and I think there's a reason why the people talking about crypto call it the digital gold and people don't call gold the physical crypto. Right. Interesting. Yeah. You never hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So are you For, advising so, clients then uh, maybe stay away? Is there a little bit of exposure that you're advising? So uh, you're not going to see a, bit, a Bitcoin ETF from us. Right. And... Um, yeah, I, I. So the way we look at at ETF investing is, we need to have a. a, a it's not just. It, this is not a marketing exercise. We need to have. We're at the end of the day. We are active investors. Our company is made up of active investors, and we want to have a direct tie into an investment case for the products that we that we put out there. A number of years ago, we were looking at. Uh, electric vehicles and renewable energy and how do we create a product that will allow our clients to participate in that trend. One of the largest uh, projects that humankind's ever undertaken, switching everything over to renewable energy. And so we're looking at electric vehicles, but then, you know, who's going to win? Is it going to be Volkswagen, Tesla, uh, a Chinese company? And so you have to make those decisions. So what we wanted to do was help investors to to get the theme right, but also to get the implementation right. right. And by and how we did that was by launching an industrial metals ETF. So whether the car is sold, the car, the solar panel, the, the wind turbine is sold in China, the US or in Europe, it contains a lot of copper, a lot of aluminum, some zinc, some nickel. And so that's a sort of a first principles um, able to participate regardless of the company and and the um, and the competitive nature of, of any sanctions or or any uh, pricing that a company would bring. So um, that's the that's an example of how we look at providing products for our for our clients rather than 
sort of the, the catchiest marketing phrase. Right. No flavor of the week over there. Right. Okay. Bob Mitter, Director of ETF Strategy at Aberdeen. Hey, thanks for coming on the show today. Really getting into these dynamics. And we'll keep an eye on Platinum and Palladium in these dynamics over the next little while. Great. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Bob. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest. I'm Jeremy Safford, and we'll see you next time.